Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea. I'm here today to talk to you about memory allocation. We are going to cover a few concepts about memory, such as virtual memory and how a process is laid out in memory while it's running. But our main goal is to take a deep dive into the Go runtime and understand how its memory allocator is implemented. First, just a bit about myself. I'm a developer at Globo.com. Globo.com is a media company from Brazil. I work at Suru, which is an open source platform as a service that was built inside Globo as a way to make our developers deploy their applications faster. You can think of it as a Heroku that you can run on your own infrastructure. And I also blog about various things on my personal blog. I'm also planning to do a big blog series, series of posts about this subject. So if you feel interested about that, you can check it out later. And I also like reading books. And this is my favorite technical books, the Linux, the Linux Programming Interface. It's a really big book. I've been reading it for over a year now, and I'm still to yet to finish it. But it is really interesting because it goes and explains exactly how many of the syscalls that are available in, in Linux works and things like that. So it's really interesting if you want to know how... Sorry. So it's really interesting if you want to know how, the Linux, how Linux really works. And one of its chap chapters is precisely about memory allocation. So it, it explains how, what are the syscalls available to allocate and deallocate memory and how can you can use it to allocate and deallocate memory. And by the end of the chapter, the, the reader is invited to implement a memory allocator. And this is how I, I got into and try, and try to understand what, how memory allocator works and how, how I could implement one. And as a Go developer, I got curious and, and wanted to learn how the Go memory allocator works. So first, just a few concepts. The first important concept is, is virtual memory. So processes do not read directly from physical memory. This happens because of a variety of reasons. Because first, from a security point of view, one could implement a process that would read the contents of the whole physical memory, and that would be pretty easy to read what other processes are writing. So that would be pretty bad in a security point of view. And also we would need to do to handle all the coordination between multiple processes. So we need to make sure that we weren't written to a memory area that other processes were written and so on. And that would also be pretty hard to do. So virtual memory is the concept that abstracts that are, that are away from the process. So the process has a, a virtual view of the memory that's available. And there are several ways to, to implement virtual memory. The most important ones are segmentation and page tables, and being page tables the most common one, this is the one that we are going to see next. So here on this slide, we can see how virtual memory works. On the left, we have a process that's running, so its memory space is divided into pages. Each page is usually 4K bytes, but that can change. And each, table has, each, page, each process has a corresponding page table, which handles the mapping between virtual pages into physical memory frames. So here we can see that page zero is mapped to frame, frame, frame tree of the physical memory. So, and we can also see that some of the memory frames on the physical memory are associated with other process, so they are never going to be mapped on our page table. And also we can see some of the mapped pages, like page six and seven, and those pages are missing a corresponding entry on the page table. This simply means that the operation system swept those memory pages out to the disk because it was, it, it was having problems like memory pressure. So once the OS feels like that there's not, not enough memory for the process that are running, they are going to be swept to the disk. So if the process tries to access something that's on those pages, the operation system is going to copy those pages from disk into the physical memory and, and update the page table with their cor corresponding entries. 
So this is pretty easy to spot if we try a, a really simple Go example. So here we are generating a random, random number from zero up to 100. Then we print the generated number and the corresponding memory address of that variable. And then we just loop forever just to, to make sure that this program doesn't exist. If we run two instances of that program at the same time, we may get an, an unexpected result, at least if you don't know virtual memory or how virtual memory works. So here we got two different values, six, uh, 53 on the first one and this address. And in the second instance, got the, we got the value 68 and the same address is reported as the address of that, that variable. This feels weird, but this address is actually just inside that process virtual address space, so it's not actually the same physical memory space, so that's, that's no big deal. Okay, and also another concept that's important to understand is how a process is laid out in memory while it's running. So a process memory layout is divided into multiple segments. The first segment is the text segment, which contains the binary code that was lo loaded from the binary. The second segment is the data segment, which contains initialized static variables. Then the BSS segment, which holds uninitialized static variables. And then the two most important ones, which is the heap. And the heap is where dynamic allocated va variables are stored. The heap grows upwards, so it's not completely mapped once the program starts. It's keep, it keeps growing as we allocate more memory. And the program break marks the end of the current heap. heap. And the other important segment is the stack. The stack holds function stack frames, so local variables and per parameters and things like that. And every time we call a function, we add its function stack frame to the stack. And when we retur return from that function, we remove it. So it grows downwards. We can think of stack allocation as simply appending uh, something to the end of an array, for instance. So here, to allocate uh, a given size, we simply increment, increment the stack pointer and return the pointer to the beginning of this light, gray, light green area. So the application is going to use this space for this last allocation. And to deallocate, we can simply just decrement the size that was allocated from the actual stack pointer. So now we have deallocated it, and this space now is completely unused and can be used for a uh, next allocation. This is far simple, it's really fast, it's not, not expensive to do these operations, but it's pretty limiting because I can't deallocate something that was allocated on the middle of the stack. So to, I need to deallocate with the opposite order that we allocated. So imagine that, uh, yeah. And to overcome th those, we use heap allocations. So heap allocations are used for objects with size only known at runtime. So in C, we usually use malloc and free to handle heap allocations. C++ has new and delete for those. But in Go, things are a bit different. We know that there, there isn't a malloc function in Go. So Go uses a technique called escape analysis to figure out if a variable needs to be allocated on the heap or on the stack. And it also has garbage collection to know when some, some variable or some values can be deallocated. So before going to the details of how Go is actually implementing memory allocation, let's see how one could build a really simple heap allocator. So to implement a minimal allocator, we need to implement two functions. The first one is the malloc function, which receives the size of the memory area that we want to allocate and, return, and must return a pointer to that area. And the second function is the free function, which receives a pointer to an area, an area that was previously allocated and must free the resources associated to it. So we can think of an allocator as being something that stays between our application and the operation system. So while the application talks to the, to the allocator by using the malloc and the free functions, the allocator is going to use system calls to talk to the operation system to both allocate and deallocate memory. 
There are several Cisco's that can be used for that. The most common to allocate, the most common use to allocate memory is the mmap Cisco. And to the allocate, we can either use mmap or the mAdvice Cisco. The Go memory allocator actually uses mmap to allocate in Linux, and the mAdvice Cisco to deallocate memory. Okay, so our minimal allocator is going to keep a simple linked list with the free objects that are, are available to fulfill allocations. Each ob object is divided into two parts. The first one is the header segment, which contains the size of the object and a pointer to the next object on the list. So, and just after the header segment, we have a, the data segment, which contains that size in bytes, and it, it's the part that's actually returned to the application as an area that they can use to allocate objects. Okay, so let's do an, an example. Let's suppose that the application called malloc passing value 10, which means that it's trying to allocate 10 bytes. And our, at the start of our program, our, our allocator is actually empty, so it has no objects on its free list. So it is going to try to traverse this list. There is no objects, so it's going to allocate a new one from the operation system. And to do that, it's going to use the mmap syscall. The mmap has a bunch of different parameters and flags and so on, but those are the most import important ones. The first parameter is the start address of this, the, this memory mapping that you are creating. The second one is the size of the, mem the memory map that you want to create. The third one is the perm this size needs to be on units of pages, so 4K, 8K, and so on, so on. Next, we can set some permissions on, on this memory map. So here we are using both write and read permissions. This is normally what you want when you are doing memory allocations for, for this, this reason. Then <laughs> there are a bunch of flags that can be set on the mmap. Some are, are really obscure ones, but usually for memory allocation, we want to use the private flag, which means that only this process is going to have access to this memory map. And also we want to use the anonymous flag, which means that we are not expect, expecting to load the contents of this memory from a file on the disk. So it's, going to, so it's not going to load that content when, once we start, when create our memory map. Okay, so we did a map. So we got a 4K bytes um, memory map. We added to our linked list. So the first first 12 bytes is going to be used to hold the header, and the rest of the bytes are, used, are available for applications to allocate memory from. But the application asked for 10 bytes. I'm not going to return all those bytes, and which would be wasteful. So we, what we do is that we are going to split this object into two objects, and we made up a, an object that's precisely the size that the user asks. Asked, so 12 bytes to the header, and then 10 bytes to the data segment that's going to hold the, the allocation. So we use a total of 22 bytes, and the rest stays on the start of our linked list. And then we can simply return a pointer to the start of this data segment, which is going to hold what, whatever the application wants to, to store there. And this is it, and that's it. If the application tries to do another allocation, we can keep it dividing this, splitting this greater object or doing new calls to a map to get more memory. And what about the allocation? So when the application once is done with using P, it's going to call the free passing P as a parameter, which is the start of the data segment of that object. If we decrement the size of the header from P, we are able to fetch its header which contains all the met metadata about that object, object, and we can simply add it to the linked list, so just adjust the pointers on the linked list to make sure that it's now back to the free list. And now a new, upper, a new allocation for 10 bytes can use this object directly. So this minimal allocator can be implemented in a few hundred lines of codes. This is actually the one that I used for the exercise on the, that book that I mentioned. 
but it has a few issues that we didn't try to solve. So the first issue is fragmentation. A, a real memory allocator has to, to try, is going to solve these issues, or most of them. So the first one is fragmentation. We keep splitting larger objects into smaller ones, but if the application now starts to allocate larger blocks, we need to have a way to, act, to also merge smaller objects into larger ones to be able to fulfill those without having to call and map again. We, are, we didn't handle corrup corruption, which means that if the application tries to free the same pointer twice, it's going to corrupt our linked list, and, if, and we need to make sure that we are not freeing the same pointer at the same time, maybe throw an error or something like that. And we are actually never releasing memory back to the operating system, so we, we need to figure out when to do that, like setting a threshold of the amount of unused, unused memory that we are going to hold, and also how to do that, what syscalls we are going to use to release that memory to the OS. There are actually many memory allocators that don't solve this one. It may sound surprising, but it's, a, it's still a valid memory allocator. And we also didn't handle anything related to multi-threading. So if multiple threads are using our allocator, we are going to probably need to some kind of lock to, to protect it from co concurrent access. So let's start to pave our way into knowing how the Go runtime allocator actually works. So first, we are going to see how a real memory allocator, not this toy one that we built, actually works. And that one is the TC malloc. The TC malloc, or thread caching malloc, is a, a memory allocator that was originally implemented for the C language by Google. It serves as a basis for the Go runtime memory allocator, and its goal is to reduce lock, conta lock contention for multi-threaded programs. So in TC malloc, each thread has a local cache, and there are two types of allocations. Small allocations, which are allocations with size less than 32 k bytes, and large allocations. And in TC malloc, memory is managed in units called spams. Each spam is a continuous run of, of memory pages. And also, instead of keeping the header segment, which is what we called on our toy allocator, close to the data segment, the actual spams are allocated in a separate memory area, and they just point to the real area that the application is going to use. So first, large allocations. Large allocations are served by the central heap. The central heap, heap is this global structure that's shared by all threads. And the requested size is rounded up to the number of pages. So if the application calls malloc with 34 or 33 k bytes, it's going to be rounded up to 36 k bytes, which are 90 pages. The central heap maintains multiple linked lists with free, object, with free spams. Each linked list maintains spans of a given size. So we have a one page which contains spans that are one page in size, two pages linked list, and so on. And the last linked list are for spans that are over 255 pages. So every spam that's larger than that is kept on a single, single linked list. And to do a large allocation, the central heap is going to start on the nth uh, linked list, so if you are trying to allocate nine pages, it's going to start looking at the nine page linked list for a spam. If, it's, if there is a spam there, it's simply going to return the memory error of that spam to the application, and we are done. If there, there isn't a spam there, we are going to look on the next linked list, and so on, until we find one. If we are going to return a larger spam to the application, we are actually going to split th that spam into two and just return the, the desired amount to the user and keep the one in another linked list. If the central heap is not able to find a uh, spam that's large enough, large enough for the allocation, it's going to use the MMAP syscall to allocate a new one and add it to the linked list before returning to the application. So it's really simple. The application talks directly to the central heap through the allocator. And if the central heap has a spam, it's returned to the application, else the central heap is going to ask for a new one from the OS. And this requires, a, requires acquiring a lock on the central heap. Small locations. Small locations are served by the local thread cache, and the requested size is rounded up to one of the size classes. There are a large number of size classes, so 
Imagine that the application calls malloc with four bytes or six bytes. This is going to be rounded up to eight bytes. And eight bytes is the first size class. And this is all done to reduce fragmentation, so you keep the number of different sizes of blocks smaller than just doing like random sizes for each kind of allocation, which makes reusing objects harder. The local thread cache also maintains multiple free lists. Each list is for a given class. So class zero has two items on the linked list and so on. These are not spams. These are objects that are smaller than spams. And for, for instance, if the application asked for an object from class zero, we can simply return one of those to them. And that's it. It's important to note, note that if the allocation is fulfilled from the local thread cache, it's not required to acquire a lock because it's local through the thread, so there, are, there, are not multiple, there aren't multiple threads trying to, to talk to the local thread cache. If the, the allocation is actu actually for class one and we are lacking any objects on the free list, we need to go to a um, more central structure, which is the central free list. There is a central free list for each of those classes, and the, those are shared between all threads, so it needs to acquire a lock. The local thread cache is simply going to ask for a bunch of objects from the central free list. And those are added to the free list, and one of them is going to be used to fulfill the allocation. But what, what happens if the central free list has no spans available? The central free list is, is then going to ask for a new spam from the central heap. And this requires another lock, which is global for, for the entire execu execution. <coughs> so this new spam is acquired from the central heap and is added to the central free list. And one of those, and some of those object, objects are going to be given to the local thread cache, and one of them is going to be used by the application. So this is the path of a small allocation. So the application first queries the local thread cache. If this is, if the local thread cache has an object of, for that given class, the allocation is fulfilled here, and no locks are required, and this is the fast path of that allocation. But if it's not if there isn't an object available, the local thread cache goes to the central free list for that class. If there aren't objects available, it goes to the central heap, and so on. Each layer below is more costly, so we try to avoid the most going below. So, yeah. So each layer also tries to acquire more objects that from the bottom layer than are required, so it tries to, to go there the minimum possible. So the allocation on TC malloc, the TC malloc allocator keeps uh, an array that maps memory pages to spams. So this means that page one and page two are managed by span A, page three, four, and five are managed by span B, and page six is managed by span C. So when the application calls free on a given object, from the object's address, we are able to fetch its page and from the page, by using that array, we are able to, to go to the spam that's actually managing that page. And from the spam, we have a bunch of metadata, which contains also the size of the objects that are allocated from that object, from that spam. So if the spam holds small objects, we are going to simply add, append that small object into the local thread cache linked list, and the, alloc the, the allocation of the object is done. But if the spam was actually used for a large allocation, we are going to have to check the pages that are near our, current, our the spam page to see if they, that page is also uh, free. So for instance, if we are the allocating spam C, we are going to check, check page three to see if, they, if spam B is also free. And if it's the case, we are going to merge both spams into a single two-page spam. And then we can simply add the new spam into the two-page free list of the central heap. And as I said before, the, some allocators never re release memory back to the OS, and this is the case of the original TC malloc implementation. All the, all the allocation, all, the, all that the, the allocation does is simply add the object into the free list 
and it keeps reu reusing those objects as, most, most, as much as possible. So we saw, we, we've been talking about malloc and free, and we all know that Go doesn't have malloc and doesn't have free. So how is the Go memory allocator actually invoked before we, we try and see how, how it differs from TC malloc? So this is a really simple Go code. We have a main, main function that calls another function, f. This f function is marked as no inline, just to make the example simpler. So we are, we are preventing the compiler to do some optimizations that would make this much harder to, to show. And all that the f function does is allocate a, allocate a variable and initializing it with value 10, and then it returns the address to that variable. So before we do anything, if the i variable is allocated on the stack and we return from f, if the main function tries to use that variable, variable this is going to result in a invalid memory access because we are going to try and access a variable that was allocated on the stack of another function. So we know for a fact that the i variable has to be allocated on the heap because m is going to try and access it. So we can use the dash gc flags, which are not garbage collector flags, they are go compiler flags to the go build command. And by passing down the dash m dash m flag to the gc flags, we are actually telling the compiler to tell us about the compiler, the optimization that, that the optimizations that it's do doing. So here, in marked with those red arrows, we see that the compiler figure, figured out that the address of the i variable escapes to heap, and it's decided to move the i variable to heap. What the compiler is doing here is called escape analysis. There are there are large, there are multiple resources about this, so if you want to, to look it up, I got some on the references. And the compiler tries the most to keep most of the variables on the stack because it's, it's much cheaper. But if it's not able to figure out if the stack is enough, it's going to place the variable on the heap, and this is the case. But how does, the, how does this translate to a call to the runtime memory allocator? So here we are also using another tool, the go to compile, using the dash capital S flag, which means that we want the go assembly output from the compiler, the generated assembly. We don't, we don't need to be a, an assembly expert. I, I don't know most of what it's on its output. But here it's pretty obvious that there is a call to a function called new runtime dot new object. And by expecting expecting the runtime code, we see that this function does a call to another function that starts with malloc, which means that we are on the, the right track. So the malloc DC function is the actual function that implements memory allocator, allocator inside the runtime. It receives the size of the object that we are allocating, also a pointer to the type, and a boolean that says if we want <laughs> this memory to be zeroed out before returning. Okay, so let's see now how the Go allocator is actually implemented and how it differs from the TC malloc. So the Go's allocator is based off TC malloc, and the biggest difference between TC malloc and the Go allocator is actually related to garbage collection. The allocator is pretty much really tightly coupled to the memory, to the garbage collector, so it needs to cooperate with the garbage collector to make sure that everything that's unused gets freed. And this also makes it really hard or even impossible to replace with other implementations. So in C and C++, it's fairly common to have multiple memory allocated implementations that you can just link into your binary and, and that's it. It's really hard I think it's actually impossible to do that in Go because this is spread around multiple parts of the runtime code, which is good for the garbage collector, but it's bad if you want to try another memory allocation implementations. And there are actually three types of allocations instead of just two. There is this different type of allocation, which is the time allocation, in, and it's used for objects with size less than 16 bytes. 
and that have no pointers. We are going to cover this one in a minute. So before diving into the details, this is a really oversimplification of how the garbage collector works in Go. So the garbage collector in Go is said to be a concurrent mark and sweep garbage collector. And basically, it scans all the objects that were allocated from an application, and then it marks the objects that are being used by the application. They're, they are said to be objects that are live. So for each object that has a pointer or is pointing to another object, all those objects are marked. And by the end of the mark phase, we, all the objects that are unmarked are, free, are unused, so they can be freed. And this, and this is called sweeping. So the objects that are not live are going to be swept on the next phase. And this actually happens into two different phases, and that's why it's called a concurrent mark and sweep. So it happens in background by a separate go, go routine, but it also happens in response to allocations. So the, the allocator, before doing some of the allocations, it's going to try and sweep some of the objects to make sure that it's not requesting memory unnecessarily. So the M heap is the central heap on the Go memory allocator. So instead of keeping just the free spams, the MHIP also has linked lists with spams that are busy. Busy spams are spams that are being used by one of those caches or were used for a large allocation. So before doing a large allocation, the MHIP is going to try and sweep the same amount of memory that was requested for this allocation. So it's going to traverse those linked lists looking for spams that have objects that are not being used anymore, that were not marked on the last GC phase, and it's going to sweep. If the spam is completely unused, it can be moved to another link, to the free linked list. So the free spams are kept in a fairly similar structure as TC malloc. The biggest difference is for spams that are larger than 255 pages. This is actually a recent change on the runtime, about a year ago, I think. And this is, they, are also, they are actually kept in a structure called a trip. A trip is a randomized binary tree. And this was actually done because some users were having performance issues with, with heaps larger than 100 gigabytes. So once they were doing large allocations, and to find a spam of a given size was becoming really costly to traverse all this, this structure. So to find a spam of a given size is much uh, performant on such a structure. So yes, people have heaps that are larger than 100 gigabytes. That was impressive. And the, the commit message has more information about this change. So after do, so the MHIP is going to traverse those lists it's going to look for a spam that's enough to, to accommodate the, the allocation and it's going to return it to the application. If there isn't a, an available spam, the Go runtime allocator is going to use the MMAPS call to allocate a new one. And after doing this allocation, depending on the, t the total amount of memory that's live on our process, this Go routine may perform some additional work for the garbage collector. And this might cause a stop the word on your program. So this means that some, uh, some of your allocations, if you are doing lots of large allocations, some of them may end up with uh, a larger latency. So it's something that we should take care or at least be aware of. Small allocations look pretty much how they do in TC malloc. So instead of talking about threads in Go, the each logical processor, which is a P on the runtime, has an M cache, which is the local cache. This local cache keeps a spam for each of those classes, for which of the size classes, which is pretty similar to CC malloc. There are 66 size classes. These are some of them. So, for instance, we have the size, the class 4 is used for objects with 64 bytes. Each span has 8K bytes, so each span is able to hold 170 objects. So doing a small allocation, the M cache is going to look for 
the corresponding spam of that class and it's going to look if there is an uh, available index to hold that allocation. If there is, this address is returned to the application, the application is going to use that slot. But if the spam is completely filled, it's going to request a new spam from the M central, which is the central free list for that class. There are one M central for each class. So supposing that we are doing an allocation for class zero, the M central has two different lists, one for spams that are non-empty and one for empty spams. So the M central is going to look for a spam on the non-empty spam list. And if there is one, this spam is returned to the mcache, and the mcache is going to use this spam to fulfill the allocation. But the mcentral may have no spams on the non-empty spams list, so it has to. So before asking for a new spam from the mheap, the mcentral is going to try and sweep the existing spams on the empty spam list. So if it's able to find to sweep the request the amount of objects that it requires. This, is, this is spam from the empty spam list is going to be moved to the non-empty spam list and it's going to be returned to the mcache. But if that's not enough, the, as a last resort, the mcentral is going to request a new spam from the mheap. So this spam is added to the mcentral list and then the spam is also sent to the local cache so it can use to fulfill the allocation. And the, the last type of allocation is the time allocation. The time, time allocations are allocations for objects with no pointers and with size less than 16 bytes. The main target, this is from, from an actual comment on the, the, the allocator code. So the main target of time allocations are small strings and standalone escaping variables. So there are, there are a few benchmarks that show that shows that it's really good for performance. So it's just an optimization. So for tiny allocations, each P, which is the log logical process, keeps uh, 64 bytes objects that was allocated from a spam. So this is a, an object and not a spam. And each tiny allocation simply appends the sub, the sub object that's being allocated to the end of this larger object. So it looks uh, how the, the stack allocation that I mentioned on the beginning works. So you just keep appending it into, appending it into an array. But if the, the array gets, if this <coughs> larger object gets completely used and is not enough to, to hold the new allocation, the mcache is going to simply request for a new object from the the P is simply going to request a new object from the mcache, and this is, works just like a small allocation. So eventually, and also this object that was being used is going to be just kept there, and eventually the GC will deallocate the old object as soon as all objects that were allocated on this larger object get freed, so it's going to sweep it. I said that uh, the original TC malloc didn't release memory back to the OS. The Go memory allocator actually does it. So the runtime periodically releases some memory back to the OS. It's going to look for spams that were swept more than five minutes ago. So if it's able to find a spam that was that were swept more than five minutes ago, it's going to release the memory the memory pages that are associated with that spam. And to do that in Linux, it used the advice syscall. This syscall is a fairly, fairly general syscall for memory allocations. You can set a bunch of different flags related to, to the memory. So in, the, in this case, the Go memory allocator uses the don't need flag, which simply means that the operation system is can simply release the physical resources that are associated with that virtual memory mapping. So it's free to just reuse the memory frames and erase the page table entries and so on. And this is part of the reason that sometimes you look at the output of top or htop or free and you see a Go process that uh, should not 
be using so much memory, but is it still using? It's simply because it didn't release memory yet. So, yeah. And just to wrap it up, so the runtime has this really cool function called the readman set. It populates a fairly large struct that has a bunch of statics about memory allocation. All of those fields got pretty nice doc comments, so you can just read and try to understand what each one of them mean. But I tried and I failed. And, but after looking at the runtime code and seeing how things work, I, I, I was able to understand most of them. So I hope the, this talk also helps you doing that. This is probably the most important slide of the talk, so if you want to take a picture, now it's the time. Uh, these are all the references that are used. I'm also going to publish all the notes I made during my research. And thanks. I, I, I also would like to thank Damian Grinsky. I'm probably getting his surname wrong. And Vitor De Mario for reviewing, reviewing this slide deck. So thanks. Questions? Yeah, once the, the spam is free, they are actually the same that happens with TC malloc where you merge spams together. That also happens on the Go allocator. So on the free list, it checks for the adjacent spams to see if they are also free and just merge them together. Yeah, even that, okay. they, they can be allocated. Yeah. But they, they need to be contiguous in memory, so, yeah. Is there a reason for the five minutes time spent to release memory? I don't, I, I, it's hard coded that, I, I don't think, oh, sorry. So the question was, if there is a particular reason for, for being five minutes to release memory, I, I didn't try to look it up on the, like the code history to see if there is, but I didn't find a, there, there isn't comment explain that, it's just hard-coded there, yeah. Okay. It's in, it's in, maybe looking at the Git history, we are able to find out, yeah. Sorry? I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> No, not not really. So uh, when memory is released back to the OS, um, how is it guaranteed that not another process has access to some sensitive data? Well, I, I'm pretty sure that it, that's the job of the OS to do that. So the memory mapping is sorry. So the question was. When once the memory is released back to the OS, how it how is it guaranteed that another process doesn't have access to that? So that's actually I think it's zeroed once you are allocating. So when you deallocate, I think that's actually the job of the OS to to do that because when you do the mad by Cisco, so everything that's on the virtual map mapping is not being used anymore and the physical memory is actually released. So I guess it's part of the OS, but, but I'm not completely sure. I can look it up later. Um, <coughs> is there any particular logic to handle goatee stocks? Because are they on the hill? Are, uh, if, and if so, is there anything, any more code running to treat them as a stock? Yeah. So I think the main difference, I, I didn't really, so the question was for GoRoutine, so each GoRoutine has a stack, so how is the allocation of the GoRoutine stack handled? That's correct. 
So that's an actual different part of the code base that I didn't really go into. But what I know that's the biggest difference is that that memory is not handled by the garbage collector. So it's freed, uh, it's manually freed once the, the go routine ends. So it's a di completely different d data path. But, but yeah, you're right. Stacks in Go, like Go routine stacks, are actually allocated on the heap. But I, I guess the, the biggest difference, and, and this is also really important for performance reasons, is that the garbage collector does not have to, to handle it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the ch subject of <laughs> an entire talk, but I know that the memory allocator keeps an structure called a bitmap, and this bitmap maintains bits for each word that is allocated on a program. So it basically sets bits on the objects that are currently being used. So based on that, this, this bitmap is kept both by the allocator and the garbage collector. So they mark the, those bits on the words that are still being used, and the allocator can use that bitmap to know if it, it's, it's possible to sweep, sweep, sweep it or not. But how does it know that it's no longer used? Is it like a reference count or something? No, it's not a reference counting. So the, the marking is actually, you mark, I think you use different colors. You have white objects, which are objects that are not being used anymore but you can mark objects as gray or black also. As soon as you allocate a new object, that object is marked black, so it can't be swept in this garbage collection phase. So, but if it's a gray object, it may be or not. So at each phase, so all objects that were marked on this phase are not being deallocated on this one, but on the next phase, everything is white and it's marked again. So it uses that as a way to, to figure that out. It's not reference counting. There is a, a really nice talk about the garbage collector. I can, it's not on my reference, but I can, can show it. Thank you. <laughs>